My name is Steve Westgarth, and today on The Engineering Leader, we're chatting about Web 3.0 and the metaverse. Today on The Engineering Leader, I'm joined by Chris Hay, a distinguished engineer at IBM IX, where he focuses on exploring technology trends so that he can effectively guide teams and customers on their digital transformation journey. Chris, thank you so much for joining The Engineering Leader today. Thank you very much for having me on, on board, so uh, looking forward to it. Uh, before we begin, could I just confirm that you also write bad code? <laughs> I write terrible code, so yes, I confirm it. Happy days. That means we are allowed to have a conversation, which is a great place to start. And, and with that in mind, why don't we kick off by getting you to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you get up to? Yeah, so as you said, I'm a distinguished engineer for IBM, which is a really super fancy title. So, uh, you know, always happy about that. But um, so what do I do? So I, I get involved in a lot of customer deliveries, and that's fine. And as you said, I sort of uh, help customers in their transformation, figure out what technology trends are going to be important, and then kind of help evolve their architecture with them. So that they're kind of future facing. Now, where did I kind of start out? Probably the thing I like to talk about the most is if I go all the way back to 2006, probably giving my age away a little bit there, but uh, I was one of the original developers for M-Pesa, which was uh, mobile banking in Africa. And you know, I sort of led the development and architecture for that for a long time. And then that's probably given me that bug of being kind of future facing and looking at different channels and, and looking at kind of massive scale and, and really trying to make an impact to the world. And I guess that's sort of how I sort of started to get interested in the metaverse in that sense, because, you know, it's a new channel, it's a new way of doing finance and sort of enabling economies as well. So yeah, that's, that's kind of my interest. But you know, um, I'm a developer, I'm an architect, you know, I, I, yeah, I can never get away from that. And in actually thinking about M-Pesa back in 2006, I mean, that was quite forward thinking, right? I mean, yeah, this was a time when you, know, you still didn't really have Wi-Fi conveniently in, in all locations. Certainly mobile phones weren't anywhere near as advanced as they are now. I mean, that, that must have been quite a big thing to have done at that time, right? It, it was absolutely huge. So if, if you think about it, it launched in 2007 and, you know, I started getting involved in 2006. So even at that point, if you think about it, the iPhone hadn't been launched yet. Now, it's really an interesting scenario in Africa, and this is why I, I sort of go back to that, because it's like we get bogged down in our legacy and our, our infrastructure. So if you think of the UK, for example, you've got thing, you at that point, you if you did a bank transfer for something, it was going to take like three days. When we launched, launched them past there, you would have essentially money moving from one person to another in less than 10 seconds, right? So here was a capability that you had in Africa that you didn't even have in the UK at this point. And it took maybe another five years before you got that in the UK. And and the reason that that kind of becomes important is we were all focusing on broadband and we all had fixed lines at that point. You know, yeah, mobile phones were, were coming along. But actually, if you look at countries like Africa, they skipped a beat. They didn't bother with, you know, fixed line phone systems. Everybody had a mobile phone at that point. Mobile phone, telephone masks were going everywhere. So when when you have that sort of jumping of um, infrastructure and you move to the next generation, straight away you start to think of, of those innovations and you embrace them and you start to do these really interesting things. So that's the kind of thing I like to think about when I'm thinking about the future with customers. It's like... Am I holding on to my legacy systems a little too much? Am I too caught up in the way that I've been doing things for however many years? And when I think about the competition that are coming along and, and the new innovators, they don't have that legacy, right? So how, you know, how are they going to skip a beat and get ahead of me because they're not constrained by that baggage? And I guess so much of that is about painting a vision, right? And actually saying yeah. what is possible. Because if we kind of think about the way that organizations today think about their tech, they think about what's possible in today's world. Whereas actually, if you can just change the narrative and say, but actually look outside of your organization, look at what technology can do, that's where you can really start to kind of drive an organization to say, hey, you know what, take a risk, do something which is big and bold. And actually, that might pay massive dividends for you. 
No, absolutely. And, and to your point, right, that, you know, one of the, my big passions, which I'm, I, I know you share the same passion, that's why diversity and inclusion is really, really important. Because if everybody's thinking the same way, and you are constrained to the same people, everybody's got the same background as you, everybody's working in the same industry as you, then everybody's going to have the same ideas. So if we extend that into things like industries and sectors, well, you know, technology trends in one sector can be applied into another, technology trends in one company can be applied into another, and then you get some of these wonderful ideas that, that sort of come together. But if everybody's got that same background, you know what, you're, you're just gonna come up with the same ideas. And, and for me, that became really clear once. Uh, I was at a hackathon and uh, I was sort of mentoring in, in this hackathon and it was uh, a lot of people going around the world. And it was a team from Asia um, who had came up with the most wonderful idea about a sort of an exchange system. So it was these people who, as you travel from airport to airport, it turns out each airport shop has different handbags, has different luxury goods, and you can only get a certain thing in New York, a certain thing in Paris. So, you know, the, you had this sort of underground network where people would go and buy, so, you know, I'm going to be in Paris, so I'll buy you this type of bag. And they wanted to turn that into a sort of an exchange and a website and a peer-to-peer -peer where people could sort of join that together. I, I can assure you right now, I could have sat there for 10 years, you know, thinking of ideating. I would never have come up with that idea, right? And and therefore, that's why these different points of view and looking what everybody else is doing in the industry and how it applies to your world is important because otherwise you miss these great ideas. And and that's, again, when we come into the metaverse, for example, that's, that's really to your point, right? It's looking forward into that future. What can I do? What is the future going to look like? And how can I play a part of that? So you've definitely spent a lot of time recently evangelizing about Web 3.0 in the metaverse. And I, yep. I really want to focus some time on that today and find out more sure. about it. So let's, let's start by focusing on Web 3.0. So start by yep. telling me, what's that all about? So I think <laughs> we're in this sort of movement, right? So I... And if you think of web one, it was very raw and, and and to some regards, it was very sort of decentralized as as you said already, right? It was the dawn of the internet, HTTP, HTML. And then really, as we moved into web two, there was this move for platformization and people talk about big tech, right? And, and that's where kind of uh, social media companies, your Netflix is, your Facebook at the times, and it's now meta. Um, you know, your Amazons, et cetera, that sort of platform focus and cloud platforms really came into play. Web3 is really about decentralization and it's about trust and authority. So I think technologies such as blockchain come into play. Um, and that's probably the major difference in that sense. And of course, it's all being fueled by crypto and Bitcoin. And as it's moved into things like Ethereum and now into NFT. So you've got this sort of technology transformation going at the same time. But at the heart of it is decentralization, transparency and, uh, you know, and not centralizing that sort of technology. So that's that for me is kind of enabling and wonderful. And, I, and it sort of it's almost like being back at Web one again. But then so I find that exciting because there's lots of opportunity. I guess if I was playing caution to the wind, then there's going to be a level of centralization because you know and I know, Steve, right, is is that if technologies like NFTs and IPFS and blockchain become really popular, then all the cloud platforms are going to uh, uh, jump on in and offer those services themselves. And that's cool, right? And, and I think we'll work out what that hybrid world is. But actually, at least at that point, you're not dependent. Um, and therefore, you're not tied to those companies and you can go off and, and, and work with somebody else. So that's, that's kind of what I like about it. So, so are we saying that Web 1 and Web 2.0 effectively go away and everything is replaced by Web 3? Or do you no. think that there's still kind of, you know, uh, a, tr a transition phase? Everything's obviously based upon those original technologies. What, what happens to the older technologies? I, I, I think we end up in this hybrid world, right? Which is, the, for a while, we're going to be in this sort of Web 2.5, right? And as I say, I, I think there are things where um, 
you know, where it makes sense to use things like crypto and blockchain, etc. And other times, you know, your I'm going to say this traditional APIs make more sense. And actually, even if you look at things like um, if you look at things like NBA Top Shots and all that, right? So if you look at Dapper Labs, who being created in their own blockchain network. But if you look at the website underneath that, right, what is there is it's a React single page application with a GraphQL layer in the middle and then talking down to the blockchain there. So it's it's already a hybrid technology. So I think we are gonna be in that space. Um, and I think that what we talk a lot about, like APIs, et cetera, are gonna be, and microservices are still gonna be super important in that world. But there's gonna be certain things where that decentralized approach is is going to become important and and that's kind of where web3 is now to the extreme there's a lot of people who go no 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 you can run everything on web3 you can everything can be decentralized i i think the reality is and and i'm sure i'm going to get sort of killed for this but i i think the reality is we're going to be in this in between world and, and i guess so much of that actually depends on who controls the data and, and I think that, you know, um, the public generally have got a lot of mistrust about data at the moment and kind of how data yep. kind of flows, where they put the data, who owns the data, who can access their data. Um, how do you think that's really been tackled in Web3? Um, I think how it's been tackled at the moment in Web3 is everything's opened and you're, you're going to be able to say, you know, let, let's take the the NFT buzz for for example at the moment right in those particular cases you're saying here's my NFT the ownership of that NFT is sitting up on the blockchain you can see all the transactions how it moved from person x to person y within that and and therefore it's completely transparent and 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 you can say the same about cryptocurrency and bitcoin type transactions or ethereum transaction you can check that on the blockchain in in reality i think it's it's probably going to be a little bit more nuanced than that because not everything you're going to want to open up to the entire world and and i can understand that in this in this pure world everybody says yeah I, I, you know you should be able to see everything but then you know what you know do you want your address to be up on <laughs> you know the internet for example probably not so there's always going to be data that's private so therefore those more private permission blockchains become important and again back to your apis and microservices become important as well so i think there's going to be certain use cases where it makes sense and there's going to be certain use cases where where it doesn't um and and I, and to that point see i think one of the things that becomes true is is the metaverse is not completely sort of built on metaverse is different from web3 right um they overlap there's areas where they kind of come together but uh, you know they are they do they are different uh goals and ideals and and you know so i think that's uh that's just something that we, we need to kind of consider you can have a metaverse without web3 so you've you've talked a lot about blockchain there, and that's a concept that I guess lots of people have heard about, lots of people have talked about, but I guess a lot of listeners might not really understand what blockchain is. So maybe give us a bit on that. What is blockchain? Okay, so I think the the, the simple way of saying what a blockchain is, it's like uh, an accounting book that's open, right? So um, just imagine this sort of great big ledger where everything like you would do with an account you know if i give you some money you would say okay i debit steve and i credit chris and and that's written on this big massive ledger right and then everybody can see that ledger open for everyone and they can have a look at it and say yeah they did this they did that right so that's that's that uh, it's kind of at its whole sort of way it's just a ledger in that sense and i'm trying to bring this down into very very simple terms so there's lots of uh technology that that uh, goes underneath that so to ensure that there is authority of the ledger who gets to write and you know and and um people aren't forging it for example so that that's kind of the key but just think about it as this big massive sort of ledger where everybody can kind of view everything that goes on now the flip of that you think that's great but but you can imagine for a second that you you start to end up in if everybody's writing to the same ledger then um that means you start to wonder well you know what how's that going to work from a performance wise and that's why you you start to get into this world where things split off into different chains etc um and then actually a lot of people do things off chain and you think to yourself well you know what's the point in doing that in the first place but you know but 
think about it as a big open ledger. That's that's the simple way of thinking about it. I want to think about you know kind of you know some real world use cases for some of this technology. And I guess you know, a big thing that's talked about in Web three is personalization. Um, I guess many consumers don't realize that their web experience is already being personalized by a lot of retailers on the web, right? Yeah. Um, but should we not be concerned about our privacy and what retailers can actually do to you know, give us that personalized experience that, that everybody's driving for? Okay, so I think on personalization, and, I, and you're spot on at the moment, right? Um, everybody is picking up information about you as you go along the internet. And there's two ways of looking at this. I would say there are People are doing this in a good way where you have a, a genuine value exchange. So I go onto a website or maybe I, I get an advert or an email or something on my phone. And there's usually some sort of identifier, right? Or some sort of tracking piece, you know, um, that is enabled with, with, with that, that communication. So it could be uh, a cookie. Um, it could be something like a pixel or something like that, but, or it could be a unique identifier that's sent with, with that mail or that image or whatever. Whatever it is, is usually something that allows you to track that communication. So that, that's kind of fine, <laughs> but usually what happens is as you're doing each interaction, maybe with a website, maybe um, with an email or whatever, you're then starting to join this up into a graph and in each interaction can be tracked. So let's say I'm just looking at pictures of, I don't know, Chelsea football players, right? There's intent that you can figure out there. Maybe this person is a fan of Chelsea Football Club or maybe you're looking at tennis shoes or jackets or something like that. Then you can start to get the intent. This person looks at this brand, this jacket or whatever and you can build up this this picture of a, of, of a person. Now... That's fine when you're just an individual retailer, you're getting to know your customer and maybe you'll give more information. So as you go through the checkout process, you'll say what your name is, what your age, what your date of birth is, um, any other questions and preferences, and that would get associated with your profile. And that's fine. And that would allow you next time that person presents themselves and says uh, and interacts with your website, they, you would be able to start to understand this person likes Nike shoes, this person likes Adidas shoes or tops or whatever, and then you can start to give that personalized experience. Where it's kind of gone a little bit crazy on the internet is you start to have these things like advertising networks and where you start to share that data. So not being able to just track you on your website, but then being able to track you on everybody else's website and then aggregate all of that data that, that is being collected in each website brought together so that you can then start doing personalized offers even if you don't know that person. And that's sort of the the real difference between that first party and third party data. First party data is data that you're collecting for yourself so that you can give a personalized experience. Third party data is that you are essentially pulling from other sources to be able to do personalization. So that exists on the internet today. And I said there is good ways and there's bad ways. Good ways at the moment is you're very open. You say, hey, you know, I want to use this data for X, Y, and Z purposes. You're compliant, you agree, you understand why that data is being used, and, and you share that with consent. Bad ways of doing that is using illicit techniques like browser fingerprinting, you know, which is just, just sort of trying to use illicit ways to work out who you are, and then sharing the data, um, collecting too much data, sharing it with people you don't have permission uh, to share it with, to therefore give personalization. So as we, this is a long answer, I do apologize, Steve, right? But, but as we move into the metaverse, I think, um, and, and this is probably more of the metaverse and Web3 in that sense, this is where it then all opens up again, right? Because we've got more channels, we've got our avatars running around, and then we're back into this world of, of um how do we govern that, right? What, what, how do you want to share that data? What do you not want to share? So it all becomes really super interesting once again. So, you know, that's a world we're moving into right now. I think it's going to be interesting um, because there's blurry lines, right? And, and, and I mean that in a sense of, I think we've got an idea of what is good level of personalization and what is a bad level of personalization when we involve human beings. But now we're going to have to go through this again with things like avatars, right? Can I, 
you know, can I have a personalized experience to an avatar? Should I directly market to an avatar? Do I know who the human being is for that avatar? If there is one, I could just be talking to a robot, right? Is it, you know, think about influencers at the moment that come along and, and hawk their stuff. Now you're going to have influencers who are avatars and they may be human, they may not be human. I mean, it's it's going to be a minefield for years to come just trying to unpack this. So you obviously love the metaverse, right? And we've kind of drifted yeah. into that topic. So let's talk a little bit more about it. I mean, Web3 hasn't fully emerged. We're already talking no. about the evolution of, of the metaverse. Um, if you had to describe the concept of the metaverse, what is it? So I genuinely, and, and I know I just said this about the Web Web three, but I have, but I think it's the next generation of the internet, right? And but I I think the promise of the metaverse is to bring together the physical and the digital world. That's what it means for me. Now, if I look at the the technical definition, it's really about a series of interconnected three D worlds, right? And I and I. I get that, right? Which is I'm going to create these different worlds and they can connect together and I can move between different platforms. But I like this idea of bringing the digital and the physical world together. That That's what gets me excited. So what I mean by that is, let's say I go into a major retailer. I'll, I'll make one up. <laughs> um, so let's say I go into a Gucci store or something like that. Um, and I look at you know all the nice bags in, in the store and it's a physical store. And then let's say I want to uh, understand more about that bag. Why can't I put on my augmented reality glasses at that point, have a conversation with a virtual assistant in the metaverse? So there's a digital twin of that store perhaps in, in another platform. There's a virtual assistant in there. I'm represented in the virtual world, even though I'm in the physical world, and then they're represented in the physical world. From like, so I think these these concepts can get merged together. We are, I think, we're a, still a while off that really happening. So think of it as Pokemon Go, but for retail. I think that's gonna. I I think we're moving into that world, but in a more standard world where we are today. You know, just having that sort of virtual 3D platform where I can go into a virtual store, I can buy some goods, I get, a, I could have a digital good, I can have my physical good to back that up, and have those great experiences. I, I you know, gets me excited, right? Um, and there's already real examples of that. I mean, they're actually been around for quite some time. So I remember probably about 10 years ago now, I bought a new sofa from CSL Sofas. And on my yeah. iPhone, I was able to see a virtual your know, representation of the sofa in my living room, you know, through the, the lens of the of my iPhone camera. And that was kind of mind blowing because you can kind of see what that sofa is going to look like. You've got other examples where maybe you want to see what a picture would look like on your wall in your world. But are we yeah. ever going to move into a world where we all put on a VR headset and then go and meet the virtual you in your meeting uh, and, and actually kind of have a virtual reality in-person meeting, you know, from my house? Is that actually a reality yes. i'm yes i'm already doing this so so i know for sure the answer is yes because i have like a ton of virtual reality meetings every week so the answer is a, a most definite yes and and actually i think if i if i think about this realistically we've been doing this sort of 2d meetings uh for a while we've all been on teams or zoom or webex or whatever and we're seeing our kind of you know uh virtual selves well you know, or, you know, a moving photograph of ourselves via those screens. If you put on your virtual reality headset and go and have a meeting in something like Horizon Workrooms or in Spatial or Altspace VR, the experience is completely different. So from the outside world, you're kind of looking at us and go, well, it kind of looks a bit cartoony. I don't get it, right? But once you're immersed in the environment, you've got that headset on, you're moving around, you're having interactions with people, it feels really real, right? So, and, and the differences are, I can have a side conversation. 
So let's say, let's take a typical meeting where you might have a, a an arena space, but then you could have lots of breakout rooms. So I could go uh, watch a presentation, interact, sit next to some people, whisper to them and say, hey, I don't quite like where they're going with that one or whatever. I might then break off to another room and have a breakout conversation, come back into the main meeting. You know, um, and then even more importantly for things like collaboration, can start to do things like design thinking. I can get my post-it notes out, right? Um, I can start thinking, and then it's going to be uh, left there forever. It's you know, if I go away from the environment, come back, my post-it notes are still going to be there. The cleaners haven't came in and removed them all or overnight. So um, those level of collaborations already having, um, and the difference it was it was breathtaking for me. And again, this is why I'm probably quite passionate about the metaverse having spent however many years with you know with our COVID environments doing zoom meetings and webexes just to have closeness to a real interaction in those worlds is just incredible so i would say go get immersed if you haven't done that already and if people was looking to kind of you know, have a go at one of those experiences or you know kind of feel what it's like to be in the metaverse how would you even get started Honestly, the quickest way of doing this is, <laughs> I, this is going to sound like an advert, but go go down to your local Argos or go on to Amazon, order yourself an Oculus Quest 2, done, right? It's, it's and, and, I'm, and I'm saying that for a reason, and I think this is why things are a little bit different, is the price point of those devices are pretty good. Uh, they're 300 bucks, right? So, you know, it's, they're still expensive, but 300 bucks, I don't need to plug it into my machine. Um, it's got an app store. It's got a, uh, a decent ecosystem. I can go and have my experience and, and I can start interacting in those environments without being wired into my computer. It's all sort of end to end there. And, and I think that's a huge differentiation point is there's a price point that works for people and there is an ecosystem that there and the technology has moved on quite a bit. So if you kind of think forward, you're to, you know, maybe five or ten years or maybe even sooner than that, you know, when people are actually interacting with the metaverse and it's kind of part of everyday life, what what do you think a day in the metaverse might look like? Or a day in you working and interacting with the metaverse? What what might that feel like to an individual? I if I if I project forward five, ten years, I think there will be less barriers to entry. Um, and what I what I mean by that is in order to have those meetings that I just described, I need to go and get my headset, which is brilliant. I put it over my 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 head and then I go into the world that, you know, whatever it's gonna be, maybe it's a spatial horizon, whatever, and then I, I go have my meeting, do whatever. You know, after a while I might get tired, I might not, and then I take my headset off. But the problem is, is I'm immersed in that world and how I'm connected to everyday world is, you know, things like notifications, my email, etc. It's still a little bit disconnected. But I, but more importantly, I have to put my physical headset uh, on. I think if I accelerate forward to five to ten years, then that's going to be more seamless, right? It's going to be just a matter of putting my AR glasses on, right? So my Apple glasses or whatever at that point. And, and you can see that kind of Meta's already on that journey. So I don't know if you've seen the Ray-Ban stories at all. They're really good, right? Okay, you don't have the augmented reality bit, so you can't, you don't have the heads up the display and the vision, but the audio, uh, both for listening and for chatting, is incredible, right? So I've done many a meeting in my Ray-Ban stories. So I think just following that technology curve, that will start to become the same uh, on your glasses, right? So if I'm gonna have a meeting, it might appear just on my glasses, uh, the audio will be connected, so it will be less about you know putting this clunky headset in. It could even be on your contact lenses, whatever. So I think that that physical world, that the physical object thing, will will be less sort of in your way. But then I also think the interactions will be cleaner as as well. So as we start going into stores, then you know the people that you interact with you know there might be a virtual agent within that store there might be a display oh sorry i'm not my microphone there might be a display or something like that and then i'm going to be interacting with somebody in another platform so these connection points are going to be less so i think i think i would expect us just to start interacting with the metaverse like we would do 
with anything else in this world, right? It'll just be like, okay, fire up Netflix, fire up whatever. It's going to be the same sort of experience. It's going to be much more seamless. So, so some of this sounds, you know, kind of very visionary and kind of like, you know, we're, we're so far away from it. But then if you think about, you know, less than 100 years ago when Henry Ford was kind of looking at inventing the car, he said at that time that if he'd asked people what they wanted, they'd have said a faster horse. You know, so yeah. there is something about actually showing people what's possible and kind of, you know, taking the horse to water, if I can use that analogy. Exactly. Um, but, but this does sound very much like the Matrix. I mean, is this... Is this a real thing? You know, I, I work in technology every day and I'm kind of sitting there going, uh, not really sure about it. You know, if I think about my mum who's in her 70s, you know, the idea of her going to the metaverse, mind blowing, you know, to think that might happen. Um, are people actually going to do this? I think so, yes. Um, I think, as I said, there's a bit of barrier to entry at the moment. But then you gave your, your mum example. My dad was a similar thing. He was like, oh, no, um, I, I'm not interested in virtual reality, not interested in metaverse. And I put my headset on him. And he was like, oh, I, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe get me one of those things for Christmas. You know? and, and actually, it's the same sort of thing. What do people want to do? They want to have conversations with their family, right? And you could be 100 miles apart. So in, in the same way as I'm having meetings with people in my company, in different countries because I can come together at the same time. I can have uh, 20, 30 people from different countries throughout the world stick on a headset and have a really great meeting experience rather than flying them all together. Then actually families that are disconnected can do the same thing. Maybe they go play a game together. Maybe they just hang out in a room together and chat, whatever. That And those are experiences you can already have today and are kind of bringing people together. So I... I it sounds futuristic, but a lot of that's already it's already here. So let's let's push the boundaries right and kind of see see where this can go. Um, I read an article last week uh, which was all about um, humans having the ability to transfer their brains into cyborgs when they die <laughs> and effectively being able to attend the funeral of their biological body, effectively transitioning permanently in, into the metaverse. With everything we're talking about. You know, that stuff doesn't really seem as much science fiction as maybe it could be. I mean, is is something like that possible? So, <laughs> and, and you're beyond my limits, but actually I'm going to, um, I have no idea, right? I have, I, again, there's a whole philosophy side of things of whether it's truly me or not me in the metaverse. But, but actually, to the point... I think there is a level of representation of you in a virtual agent form in the metaverse that becomes really interesting. So let me let me break down a few technologies and then and then tell me if it sounds un, unreal or not. So I'm going to take ignore the metaverse for a second, but let's say I can create an you would agree Steve that I I can create an avatar of myself, right? 3D representation that can move around, etc. That's fine. You happy with I that? I have an avatar myself. Yep, I'm very happy with that. I have an avatar. All is good. Fine. So that avatar, in the same way, using AI technology, same things that you do in games, you can you can train that avatar to wander around an environment and interact, etc. With your control, and you can move that avatar. You're happy with that, right? Yeah, happy with that. But but consciously, that avatar is not me. So that is a virtual representation of me. That is correct. And at the moment, you control that avatar. But let's go a little bit further. So let's say I want my voice at the moment I speak. So let's take something like a chatbot. You've had a chat with a chatbot on a website, for example. You happy with that, right? So you go in and it says, hello, I'm whatever, you know, how can I help you today, conversation. How is that chatbot on a web uh, experience created? Well, there's a few technologies that are involved. There is... Um, there is essentially a, a little web page or whatever, and then you're gonna start to have things like natural language processing. Yeah, so the the ability to type something in there and that be understood, right? And then there's things like all the various intents, etc., to understand the intent of the conversation. There is knowledge bases behind that, and then AI technology today has things like Q and A, where you can, you know, um, essentially ask a question, and it can either use a short form check or it can do a long form and go or a long tail response check the internet get a response that that's all stuff that happens today within chat technology right so if i want to build a virtual 
agent, I can take all those same technologies like, uh, you know, natural language processing, the Q&A technology, all the stuff that's open source, hook that together and ask a chatbot a question that will come back with an answer. So the next thing to connect that up to the avatar, there's a few other things that I would maybe need, right? Which is I need to, because I want to have a human interaction. So speech to text and text to speech becomes important. So if I, if I say, hello, avatar, go do this, you know, it gets transferred into text, and then it can go and interact with the chatbot as before. And then when you get a response, essentially you can take that and do a text to, you know, text to speech back the way. So now if I combine that with deep cloning of your voice, right? That's a technology that exists today. So there's nothing stopping me uh, deep cloning my voice. And therefore that, that uh, speech to text can now sound like me. And then if I take something like uh, something that exists in something like Unity already today is lip syncing a voice. Um, uh, so lip syncing your uh, text to voice. Um, so when my face moves, uh, my lips are moving in sync to the speech. These are all the elements, although very crude, that would allow you to have a virtual avatar that represents you that can go and ask questions and do stuff. So really, all you're really then saying is, you know, how do I then add more skills in the same way as you would do with an Alexa today to go and interact with more things? Go get my insurance, go buy me this thing. You know, if if you want your avatar to turn up to a meeting and then approve something, there's no reason using technologies today why that avatar couldn't act in your behalf on a meeting. And then if there's something it doesn't know, go go find you and, and, and get the real answer, right? So I think all of that technology-wise exists today, although in a very crude form. But in the future, I think that's going to evolve. We're going to have more skills. There's going to be uh, more elements, more of your personality you'll want to bring to the avatar so it's got the same tone of voice, just same way as, as an email has a tone of voice, right? And that's infused with AI. You'll be able to do the same with your avatars. Will it truly be you, though? Nah, but... Um, but I think your avatar will start to represent you in the metaverse and in different worlds and in even regular internet interactions to do those things that you don't really want to do today. Sim simple things like waiting in a queue for a bank, right, to see an advisor. It's like hand that off to your avatar. Things like going speaking to insurance comparison websites. Why do I want to go and look up 30 different insurance comparison websites, right? You know. This is the rough price point I want. This is my car details avatar. You go deal with the 30 different country, uh, companies and get me the best uh, price for my car insurance. These are the sort of things that I think your avatar will start to deal with for you. You know, how, how often have you thought in your work life, you know, if only there was two of me, you're, you're really busy. I, I have a really busy job. I, I do a lot of work. Um, you know, if there was somebody that could you know, have the same thoughts, feelings, you know, as, as I have, they would make the same decisions of me. You know, actually, that that sounds pretty helpful to have something I can program to be able to do stuff too, but it's still a bit, you know, freaky or you know, kind of. You, know, you could see why people would be a bit like, you know, really, we're actually going to kind of do that. But I can see it catching on. I think it, you know, it's, it's got huge power. Yeah, I, I, I think, I think it's 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 going to happen. It's it's just a matter of time, right? I mean, I, I mean. I don't want to give away. And how many times have you been in a meeting where you think it's absolutely pointless, right? I'm only here to say the words I approve at the end, right? Um, I've done the pre-reads, I've done whatever, but there might be something I'm not aware of or sure of. And therefore, if that occurs, if something goes against those guardrails, then I, I want to be able to handle that. Perfect example for, for your avatar. <laughs> Send your avatar in, right? If, if you're within the, gu the guardrails, you know, it'll do the approval thing, and but if it if if it needs actual you at that point, cool, right? Drag you in, you know, and you can just teleport in, and and off you go. Um, but is it coming? Yes. Is it scary? Maybe. But then, doesn't that free us up to do more interesting things, right? And and have more time to do value things as opposed to stuff we don't want to be doing. Yeah. And and as I said, those scenarios we said there. All of the technology exists today to do that. None of that is beyond technology capabilities uh, that we've got today. 
And the thing which really makes me actually believe that you're right, this is coming where we're going, is because people are actually investing in this. Um, Gartner recently named the metaverse one of the top five emerging trends and technologies for 2022. Spending on VR and AR, the metaverse's foundation technologies, is expected to rise from 12 billion in 2020 to 72.8 billion in 2024. Yeah. I mean, that's a huge amount of money to be investing in something which isn't tangible, right? Well, it it is a huge amount of money, um, isn't it? Tangible? Well, here's 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 the question I I would then say back to you, this Steve. What what is tangible, right? So let's. What does it take to in, to participate in the metaverse, right? And and I'm gonna ignore you know purchasing land in the central land for hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? I'm gonna ignore that for a second. But actually, if I want to participate in those worlds, then they are really an existing, they are a new channel, right? Now it's more than that, right? We're talking about all of these different platforms and worlds and interconnection. But if you think about your regular IT strategy for a second, it's another channel, right? And there are things, and we, we understand how to deal with new channels, right? Which is, let's say I go and speak to a customer in the central and or I go and speak to a customer in the sandbox, for example, right? I don't want a siloed experience. I don't want to be in a scenario where somebody goes and have a, has a conversation with a customer and then it's not logged in my CRM system, right? Or, you know, maybe you sell something in the metaverse and it never ends up in your commerce engine, right? That that, that wouldn't be good business. I, is that fair, right? Do you want that? So therefore, if you are trying to think about how how do I be tangible, how do I have an investment in the metaverse? Well, actually, you need to go back to your overall IT strategy in general and start to say, well, to be successful in the metaverse, I'm going to need to start thinking about things like headless. I'm going to need to start investing in my API strategy because if I want to do something useful in the metaverse, I, I need to expose some of the things that my business does unique that provides value to these channels. And the way that we do that is via things like APIs. Now, of course, in a Web3 decentralized world, there is a whole set of other things that you might want to get involved with, you know, with your smart contracts. But actually, if you think about your IT strategy today, start to invest in APIs, start to invest in, in breaking up your monolith and being able to have these value services that you can compose and play in an ecosystem. That's just good IT, right? <laughs> then if you start to think about, well, actually, I want to I want to have those conversations where it's logged in my CRM, I want to um, be able to personalize as well. That means being able to understand what data I do want to capture and how I permission and how I do that in a responsible fashion, but then feed that into my existing systems so that I know if I'm having a conversation with Steve in the metaverse, then I can then have a personalized conversation and, and personalize and not send them the same offer that I maybe sent in another world. But then it gets more complicated, right? Because then we're in this whole world of, you know, the, your avatar is not you and direct to avatar marketing. And that's a whole different piece. But in order to get to those worlds in the first place, you need to start working on your IT strategy. You need to start investing in your APIs. And then, of course, a sensible place to start investing is things like 3D assets, right? And how and avatars and tone of voice, etc. So all of the things that you want to be doing in your digital estate anyway, that we've been all touting on about for years, will actually to play nicely in those channels and not have a siloed experience, you, you need to start investing in that now because that's going to pay dividends when you get into the metaverse and all these different platforms. But given that organizations are quite often having difficulty just getting the basics right, you know, there are organizations that, that haven't yet, you know, kind of worked out how we work in a web 2.0 world in, in an effective way. Um, is the world really ready for the metaverse? So I'm going to come back to what we talked about at the beginning of the conversation, right? About legacy and the impasse journey, right? The people that are holding on to their legacy technology, right? 
they are going to be in a different position for people who are metaverse native, who are just jumping into the technology and are not held back by their past. In the same way that in past in Africa jumped past fixed mobile phones and they jumped past regular bank uh, uh, banks with um, physical branches and they moved straight into mobile phone enabled finance. Right. There is going to be a generation. There's going to be people who are going to be metaverse native. Right. And, and that is coming. And you can see that already with platforms like Roblox, where, you know, kids are out building their own worlds and, and, and just creating these amazing spaces. They are metaverse natives. And, and maybe it's five years, maybe it's 10 years, but they are going to move into a world of business. And, and that's already happening where they're going to build things in a metaverse native uh, way. And they're going to start disrupting businesses in the same way as fintechs are disrupting banks, right? Because they don't have the mainframe, they don't have the IT processes, uh, you know, that they created 30, 50 years ago. They are moving straight into that native world and building natively for those platforms. Now, the the trick for organizations today is to not be left in that that same trap and that is to say well you know what i'm not going to be hold, held back by my legacy i'm going to build for these worlds and not be displaced but i'm going to use my advantage the things i know things like the data etc how to interact with customers to do that to move into that new world but if but if you just go ah yeah no it's too far off you're going to get displaced and the thing is, I, I know what you're saying is true. I mean, there were some really great examples in relatively recent history. Um, there was an opportunity for Blockbuster back in your sort of the early 2000s to purchase Netflix. And Blockbuster management turned around and said, streaming isn't the future. Everyone's going to need to have DVDs and they're going to want to do video rental. And then look at what happened in that example. And I mean, that's just one example. And there are, there are tens, you know, maybe hundreds of examples of those sorts of things uh, where exactly. companies have been disrupted by technology and people haven't embraced and kind of moved on. So so I, I'm totally on board. I know exactly this is where we're going to. But I think, you know, people are getting their head around it. It's still a huge transition for kind of people to understand what this is really it, going to do for businesses. It, it is. And the platforms that we are talking about today, so we talk about Meta, we talk about the Central and we talk about Sandbox, we talk about Roblox. Who are I'm I'm going to hate to say the word web because because that's quite a web two o way of looking at things, <laughs> um, but who the winners, what the the platforms that remain are, I don't know, right? I you know I'm not going to predict that in five years time. I don't you know new things will pop out and, and appear out of nowhere, right? And hopefully if the metaverse vision is 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 uh, true then it won't matter so much because we'll be able to jump from different worlds so i don't know what the individual platform that will remain are but do you know what i don't think that's important for companies i think what is important is to participate and understand and and play in those areas and experiment but then build their own it strategy along with that right and that means investing in in things like uh, APIs and microservices, extending your digital platforms into those channels just to even prove out your your next channels and connect it back into your space and becoming native in those worlds. And then experiencing, creating those presence and presences and things like Horizon Worlds or Roblox or whatever, and creating your 3D digital assets. Because when you do that, you will start to understand for yourself how these platforms are work and you can evolve your IT strategy. And then no matter how the the sand shift, then you are going to be able to adapt and work with it. But if you just sit in the background and say, eh, it's not going to happen, I, I, it is going to happen. It's already happening. Um, Chris, it's been absolutely fascinating chatting today. If you've piqued people's interest, maybe listeners who want to know more, um, you've got a YouTube channel, is that right? How can people get in touch with you? Yeah, no, my YouTube channel is is probably the best one. So, um, in fact, if you just type in Chris Hay UK, I, I mean, it, either my LinkedIn, my Twitter, or my I'm not so active on my Twitter, um, but my YouTube is probably the the best way of interacting with me. And and probably I probably spend more time talking about business scenarios, etc., on my LinkedIn for the metaverse. But in my YouTube channel, I spend more time talking about the technologies and coding things up. So if you want to see how to start coding things up and, and building things for the metaverse and having that deep dive of how to do that in JavaScript and or Rust or whatever, then my YouTube channel is probably the place to go. But if you just want to hear sort of 
uh, snapshots of, oh, this is where the metaverse, this is what you need to do about your IT strategy, then go go follow me on LinkedIn because that's where that content tends to reside. Brilliant. Well, Chris, I'm definitely going to ask you to come back onto the podcast at some point, maybe in a, a few months or a year, and we'll kind of look at how far we have advanced into the metaverse. But for the <laughs> meantime, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for joining the Engineering Leader today.